Hello and welcome to Scotia Gamer. Now you might think, why do a Switch buying guide in 2023? Doesn't everybody who wanted a Switch already have one? Well, it turns out no, actually. And this guide was born out of simple practicality. In the last few months, I had a number of families approach me asking if I knew anything about buying a Switch system. And I'd say, well, sure, I know lots about buying a Switch. What do you want to know? Now, in some cases, the potential buyer didn't really know anything about video games at all, but was interested in buying the console for their family. In other cases, the buyer was already familiar with video games, but happened to skip out on the Switch generation, and was just now in a place where they could consider buying one. So, this guide first started out as a very long text message, before eventually evolving to a blog post, and then finally becoming this video. I'm going to go over all the basics of buying your first Switch, what to look for, what pitfalls to avoid, as well as making some game suggestions. This guide is essentially for someone who doesn't already own a Switch and knows very little about it, but even if you're already a Switch owner, you still might learn something new. So come along and join me on the Scotia Gamer 2023 Switch Buying Guide. There are currently three models of the Nintendo Switch. They are the Nintendo Switch Base Edition, which retails for about 400 Canadian, the OLED Edition, which retails for about 450 Canadian, and the Switch Lite, which retails for about 260. Here, we're mostly going to be talking about the base Nintendo Switch system, and that's gonna come with everything you need for basic play. So you have the Switch itself, which is this little six inch, 6.2 inch screen tablet, it's going, to it's going to come with the Joy-Con controllers, which are able to snap onto the Switch in order to play in handheld mode or be used in different configurations. It's going to come with the Switch TV dock, a power cord and a HDMI cable. I just don't have the HDMI cable here because it was still plugged into my TV. It's also going to come with a Joy-Con grip, as well as these two little Joy-Con cables. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the Nintendo Switch Lite, and while it plays Switch games, it doesn't really switch, and that is that it only works in handheld mode. So right off the bat, you'll want to discard that as an option if you want to be able to play on the TV. It does have some advantages. It's smaller and lighter weight, and the controllers are attached to it, so it makes it a bit more portable. Uh, but it won't connect to the TV, so if you want to play on the TV, that's not going to be an option. It will still sync with Joy-Cons for games that require them, but again, you'll have to play on the smaller screen. There was also an older model of the Switch that's no longer being sold. On the newer models, they improved the battery life and patched a security hole. But unless you're going to get into a homebrew scene, which we're not going to cover here, it's not something you really need to worry about. The Switch OLED model is a newer version of the Switch that still has all the same features as the original, including handheld and TV play, but with a few more premium options. Its main differences are that the screen is bigger, so the Switch itself is the same size, but the screen actually takes up more area than it does on the original Switch. The dock also includes a wired Ethernet port, which can be really handy for online play, and it also includes a stronger, higher quality kickstand than the one you'll find on the back of the Switch. The Switch OLED also has more storage, where you'll find 32 gigabytes in the base model of the Switch. You'll find 64 gigabytes in the OLED edition. Now, if I were buying my first Switch or wanted a second one for some reason, I might spring the extra 50 bucks and get the OLED model. You can also frequently find bundles of the OLED Switch at places like Costco, which will include a few extra accessories on top of the console itself. But the thing is, the OLED is really for people who want a premium experience, including that better online play, and many folks just aren't going to care about that. You absolutely do not need to get an OLED Switch. If you're more of a casual family player, a regular Switch will work just fine and save you 50 bucks. So it's up to you, but there is no difference in functionality between the regular Switch and the OLED Switch. The OLED is just a bit more of a premium experience. Next up, let's talk about the Joy-Cons. They are versatile little controllers. All Joy-Cons are either a left Joy-Con or a right Joy-Con, and that depends on if they go on the left side of the Switch or the right side of the Switch. Although the left and right Joy-Cons have almost the same functionality, they're not identical as the button placement is different, and the right Joy-Con also has an occasionally used IR camera. You can use them in three main modes. So the first mode would be simply attached onto your Switch like so. 
And in this mode, they act together as a singular controller. The second mode is docking them into the Joy-Con grip, which I have right here. And again, in this mode, generally, they're going to act as a controller. It's just going to give you slightly better ergonomics. Finally, you can also use each Joy-Con as a singular controller, depending on the game. They can simply be held like so. Or if you're using motion controls, it's usually recommended to put it into a rail and attach it onto your arm. Or if you want a bit better ergonomics for using it as a standalone controller, you can also go ahead and get yourself one of these grips and put it in like so. And that just gives you a bit more grippability when you're playing a game using just a singular controller. Now, if you remember from days gone by, a controller like the Wii Remote, the Joy-Con is actually quite similar, it's just a lot smaller and more compact. Now, there is a caveat here. Some games will allow you to use a singular Joy-Con as a controller, while other games will require that each player have a pair of Joy-Cons to play with, unless it happens to be compatible with a Switch Pro controller. In order to support at least two players on any given game, you'll likely need an extra controller. You might be tempted to just go ahead and grab an extra set of Joy-Cons. This will set you back $99 and sadly doesn't even include an extra Joy-Con grip. Gaming certainly isn't a cheap hobby, so I do like to provide alternatives that might help you save some money. And to be fair, getting another set of Joy-Cons will give you the most bang for your buck. Right off the bat, you'll have at least two controllers for any given game, and for some games, you're already going to have four controllers. But using a Joy-Con as a singular controller isn't the most comfortable experience. As I mentioned, you could go ahead and get a grip, and you can get about two of these for $20. I would recommend that if you're going to be frequently playing with a singular Joy-Con. But this really isn't your only option. The next popular option for a second controller is to get a Nintendo Switch Pro controller. And this is basically a larger controller that works like two Joy-Cons glued together. It's larger, much more comfortable, and ergonomic. It will set you back $90 versus $99 for two Joy-Cons, and it doesn't need a grip, and it can be charged directly via the USB-C port on top. But nothing is ever that easy. There are a few games that will only work with the Joy-Cons, not the Pro Controller, and this is games that mostly require heavy motion controls. The Pro Controller does have some motion controls, but it's much more limited than the Joy-Con and what it can do. There aren't many games that I know that don't work with the Pro Controller, but Super Mario Party is one example. Uh, so you want to think carefully if your second controller should be another set of Joy-Cons, which are more versatile, or a Pro Controller, which is optimized for non-motion games and traditional TV play. There are third-party controllers which you might want to consider as well, and while they can be a little cheaper, be warned that you might take a hit on the quality. There are a lot of third-party Joy-Cons you can find, although personally I don't have much experience with them, and to date I've only used the official Joy-Cons. Third-party Pro controllers, however, could be a good option depending on what you're looking for. Power A, for instance, makes Pro controllers that are about $20 off of the original, and you can also get wired Pro controllers, which can be good quality and also save you money up to about $50. But the caveat of course is that they don't work wirelessly and must be physically connected to your Switch dock via USB. Now that's not necessarily a deal breaker depending on how your Switch couch TV placement is set up. Now there is another third-party style Joy-Con controller that you might be interested in checking out and that is the Hori Split Pad Pro. So these are officially licensed by Nintendo, and they come in these cool little themes. For instance, I have the Pokemon one here. Uh, right away, you can see that it's much larger and easier to hold and grip than a traditional Joy-Con. But these controllers only work in wired mode. They don't work wirelessly, and they lack any of the gyroscopic or motion features of the Joy-Con. One game that makes use of those motion controls is actually Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu, and somewhat ironically, I can't use the motion controls when using the Pokemon-themed Hori Split Pad. 
If you want something a little larger than a Joy-Con, but a bit smaller than the Split Pad, you can also check out the Split Pad Compact. Another option you might be interested in is what I'm going to call Binbok or Nixie style controllers. And you can usually find these on Amazon and they're larger versions of the Joy-Cons similar to the Hori Split Pad, but they do work wirelessly and do have motion controls. They're also not officially licensed, so I can't really say what they're like in terms of quality. They might work just fine for you and that might be an option you want to check out. Next up, let's talk a little bit about the dock. The dock is what allows you to play the Switch on your TV, and it's absolutely the Switch's killer feature. It's very easy to use. You just plug the dock in via power and HDMI to your TV, and then you dock or place the Switch in its receptacle, allowing it to connect to the USB port. And now your Switch is on the TV, and you can play it on the TV. Fun fact, the Switch dock and the Switch OLED dock are completely compatible, and the Switch OLED dock also has that wired Ethernet that I mentioned. And this is probably how you're going to charge your Switch 99% of the time. But the power cord which connects to the dock can also connect directly to the Switch via USB-C, so if you're taking your Switch somewhere and don't want the dock, you can just bring this along in order to charge your Switch. This will also charge your Joy-Cons while they're docked on the side, but of course it can only charge two at a time. If you have four Joy-Cons, you might want to go ahead and get something like a Switch Joy-Con charger, uh, which I have here, this particular one by Nico. And that will allow you to charge all four Joy-Cons at once. Or you could go ahead and get a charging grip like this one, and you'll compare that the original grip doesn't have a USB-C port on top while this one does. So this one will not charge your Joy-Cons, but you can charge your Joy-Cons with this grip and you can continue to do so while you play. For what it's worth, my personal setup is to have two Pro Controllers and four Joy-Cons, and this will give you a wide range of options when playing with others. I actually used to have six Joy-Cons, three left and three right, but I sold one set as they were never used, and the only game I even had that could support that many Joy-Cons at the same time was Just Dance, and I never used that many at once. There are also adapters which will allow you to connect older controllers to the Switch, such as GameCube, or newer controllers like the Xbox Series controllers, and I have a whole video on those if you're interested in checking that out. I should mention that there are some options for third-party docks as well, and I'm planning to do a video on those in the future. There are a few things that you need to be warned about and some caveats if you want to go down and pursue the option of using alternative docks. So let's talk about games. First of all, they're not cheap, and the Switch doesn't really come with any, so you get to buy those separately. An average first-party Switch game will run you around $80 Canadian, but there are plenty of cheaper options too, which are certainly still enjoyable to play. You can buy games either digitally or physically, but you don't really save much money by buying digital games. It'll be $80 either, either way. There are occasionally digital-only sales, but they are rare, so personally, I prefer to buy most of my games physically. You'll get the case, as well as the cartridge, and yes, they're a bit more cumbersome, but the huge benefit, of course, is that you can resell them uh, when you're finished playing with them and often for pretty close to what you actually paid brand new. And you can probably see where I'm going with this, but you rarely have to buy new games either. In my experience, once a game is out for a month or two, weeks in some cases, you'll see used copies of these often for $20 or so less. And while I can't guarantee it 100% of the time, I've bought plenty of used games and never had an issue with any of them. The cartridges are pretty durable, and fun fact, they taste really bad to discourage eating. So that's a great option to to save some money unless you need to get a game on launch day. Digital games are more convenient, but they can't be bought or resold in any way. I will sometimes buy digital games if they are very cheap or it was a game that was released only digitally. The Switch also has a lot of indie games, so games not made by the big studios, who often don't have the resources to release games physically. So if I wanted to get one of those, I would buy it digitally, and they're usually cheap enough that it's not too big of a deal, but I do prefer to get physical games whenever possible. Also, the Switch storage space isn't great. Like I said, it's 32 gigabytes on the standard model, 64 for the OLED, and it's going to get filled up pretty quickly if you're only buying digital games, so you would have to go out and buy a memory card anyway. 
If you're looking for a fun game for the whole family, you can't really go wrong with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. There are lots of different play methods and styles, as well as assist modes for younger players. If you want a fun action adventure and puzzle game, check out Luigi's Mansion 3 or Super Mario Odyssey. Both games are phenomenal, and honestly, I'd put Luigi's Mansion 3 in my top favorite three games of all time. I rate it even higher than Odyssey, which is saying a lot, as I would rate this game very high. And Luigi's Mansion 3 was made by a Canadian company, which is pretty awesome. I've played it through end-to-end -end three times now, and even strive to get 100% collectibles in the game, which for me is pretty rare. Usually I just finish the main storyline of a game and move on, but it's really just that good. If platformers are more your thing, you're going to want to check out Super Mario 3D World or New Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, and a new platforming game, Super Mario Wonder, will be coming along for the system very soon. If you're interested in more party-style games that you can play with lots of people, some good options there are Super Mario Party, Mario Party Superstars, any of the Just Dance games, as well as Nintendo Switch Sports, which is the spiritual successor to Wii Sports, if you happen to remember that game. Finally, if you're looking for some games to just kick back and relax, I would recommend Animal Crossing and Minecraft. Sometimes you can get a bundle with a digital game included, often Animal Crossing or Mario Odyssey or Mario Kart, and even though it's a digital game, not a physical game, I would still say that it's worth it if you can get a bundle with a game included. One downside I'll mention to the Joy-Cons is the frequent problem of Joy-Con drift. The analog sticks don't always quite work properly and will cause the character to move without any actual pressure on the stick. Some people will see drift on their Joy-Cons almost right away, and some never will. For what it's worth, it took about five years of owning my Switch before I saw drift for the first time. To their credit, however, Nintendo has acknowledged the problem and will generally repair any Joy-Cons that drift. You just have to mail them away, wait a few weeks, and get them back. They repaired mine no problem, and I don't even think it took a week. You'll also want to get a good carrying case for your Switch if you ever plan to take it anywhere. A screen protector is also a really good idea too. And again, Costco usually has a good bundle where you can get a Switch carrying case and a memory card. Although you don't necessarily need the memory card, so you might be able to save money just by getting the case elsewhere. Be warned that many cases will only just carry the Switch, the uh, two Joy-Cons and the charger, as well as some games. So if you want to carry more things like the dock, you're going to need a bigger case. If you want to play Switch games online with others over the internet, you're going to need a Nintendo Switch online subscription. It's about $25 for a single user or $45 for a family of up to 8 users per year. As an included bonus, you get a good selection of NES, Super Nintendo, and Game Boy games to play. And for an extra fee, you can also get access to Nintendo 64 and Sega games and Game Boy Advance games, as well as extra content for games like Mario Kart or Animal Crossing, which otherwise you'd have to buy separately. So if you're interested in playing online, you'll want to look into Nintendo Switch Online, but if you're happy just playing locally and you don't want that extra content, then there's no need to go out and get a Nintendo Switch Online membership. We should mention the elephant in the room, and no, I don't mean Elephant Mario from Super Mario Wonder. The Switch is six years old at this point, and although nobody knows for sure, many believe it's going to be replaced with a successor Switch 2 console in the next one to two years. Outside of rumors and purported leaks, no one really knows what the next console is going to look like, or even if it'll be backwards compatible with the current generation of games. The biggest hope is that it'll retain a similar form factor to the Switch, but solve some of the issues with the current generation, like the Joy-Con drift, and the outdated graphics when compared to current generation consoles. But Nintendo usually has a trick up its sleeve, and for all we know, it'll include a band that wraps around your head to play games with your mind. Who knows? For what it's worth, my personal wish list for a Super Nintendo Switch is pretty simple, but I would like to see increased Joy-Con ergonomics with Hall Effect sensors in order to avoid that drifting problem, a wireless charging option, and even possibly a wireless docking option, or a streaming dongle which would open up the possibility of easily adding DS, 3DS, or Wii U games to the online service. So whether you think you should wait for a successor console or get the current generation is really a personal choice, but if you haven't gotten a Switch yet, you're probably not too concerned with always having the latest and greatest, and you'll still get many years enjoyment out of the current generation Switch. I remember getting my Game Boy Advance just a few months before the Nintendo DS came out and was like, oh, well, maybe I should have waited. 
but I still played my GBA for many years and ended up being glad I did it that way because I got a 3DS model instead, which ended up being backwards compatible with DS games. So hopefully that gives you a good guide on what buying your first Switch in 2023 will be like. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like. You can also leave a comment and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Let me know what important advice you think I might have missed out on. This is Scotia Gamer. As always, have a great day and game on.